Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father Alpha, we come to you today, Lord, asking that you will open up your communication pathways. Help us to understand those lessons that you would have us to receive from your word. In your son's name we pray, amen. Amen. And so be it. Yep, y'all, we're here in the third part of our mini-series on the Shepherd of Hermas and Visions. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest, if you haven't done so already, to listen to the other two classes that we've done already. We, ha we have limited battery power here, so we're going to jump right off into it without much introduction. And you may not get a lot out of this class if you're not familiar with what we've already talked about in Vision 3. And maybe even back in the classes that we did on Vision 1 and Visions 2. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, again, we are getting this document from a uh, web page called uh, en.wikisource.org. And they give us the opportunity to see a digital version of the William Wake edition. We're going to click in on Vision 3, and we're going to start down on what verse, Dave? We will be starting today on verse 33. I understand we are starting on verse 33 out of Vision 3. All right, let's jump right into it. Verse 33. And when she had showed me these things, she would have departed. But I said to her, Lady... What doeth it profit me to see these things and not understand what they mean? Okay, so like we said, if you haven't checked into the other classes, you have no idea what we're talking about. And what he's talking about, what he's been shown, is a vision of the kingdom of God. A vision of the third temple, no doubt. How it is being constructed from the stones that are our spirit. Right. Mm-hmm. And what he's saying here is that, you know, what good is it for you to show me this parable? I have no idea what it means. You're going to have to help me out and have, you have to explain some of this stuff. Right. 34. She answered and said unto me, You are very cunning in that you are desirous to know those things which relate to the tower. Yes, said I, lady, that I may declare them unto the brethren, and they may rejoice and hearing these things may glorify God with great glory. Yeah, guys, like we said, you know, you want to go in and you want to read this book called The Shepherd of Hermas because, you know, it's really going to touch your spirit. If this message ever sinks in, you know, it'll give you a lot of hope as far as making it into the millennial age that what we call the kingdom of heaven because it gives us instructions. Yeah, it gives us instructions on what we need to do to fix the wrongs that we have in our lives and start preparing um, for the kingdom. Yeah, and we're talking about this entire book. It has three parts in it. Um, the first part is this visions that we're going over now. The second part is maybe definitely more important. It's uh, on commands where it gives us um, rules associated with you know our anger. Like Stacy said, it, it, it talks on our shortcomings. Things that has to be removed from our person, from our spirit, from the way we live in order for us to go on to inherit the earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 35. Then she said, Many indeed shall hear them, and when they shall have heard them, some shall rejoice and others weep. And still, even these, if they shall repent shall rejoice too. Yeah, because um, what we're hearing is the flaws that we have in our spirit. And, you know, this is going to touch every one of us. No, Nobody is perfect. Um, at least very few of us have gotten this thing right so far. And our flaws are going to be identified. And, you know, some of us are going to rejoice in it, you know, because we see a pathway to the Father that is attainable. Whereas before it was hidden from us, as this book was hidden from us, we didn't have a, a, a clear way of getting into the kingdom of heaven. Um, I don't know about you, but many in churches I went to, you know, they often cast doubt on our salvation, you know, without any type of, you know, criteria that we are 
to go by or anything. They just say, you know, if things don't seem to be going right for us, it's, it's probably because we are damned or something like that. Yeah, and they have even put us in a position to believe that if we just believe, even though we do have shortcomings, um, we can just step right into the kingdom. And Hermes lets us know that we have to correct those shortcomings before we're able to be part of the kingdom, able to be part of the tower. Yeah, and it, and it's what it, it, it gives us a lot of joy seeing the process even though you know it, it will be a hard road for us you know you know we got on this journey probably you know for back a few years ago and mm -hmm. you know even back then you know i recognize in myself how much of a hard journey it would be because i had many of these shortcomings like anger uh lack of patience and i knew that there was a lot of stuff that you know was going to take a lot of effort on my part in order to achieve these things but having that plan having a way having it having the instructions before me gave me a lot of joy mm -hmm. you know and, and then you see where it says and they shall repent so a lot of those shortcomings like anger I mentioned you know I had to repent of that and I still am I'm still not perfect as far as that's concerned but Again, we have this pathway, and I know what it is that I need to be doing. And you know, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm guessing anymore. Like there is a chance that you know I'm gonna be a failure because I'm ignorant as to what it takes to uh, get into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, and this book does does it all for you. It helps you so much. Um, Thirty six. Hear therefore what I shall say concerning the parable of the tower. And after this, be no more longer impudent with me about the revelation okay so she's given him the vision in our last class uh, verses I think it started in verse 22 she's given him the uh, vision and now she's going to go on to explain um, what it is that Herman saw 37 for these revelations have an end seeing they are fulfilled but thou doest not leave off to desire revelations for that are very urgent. Now I have been thinking about this part right here. Every time I this verse comes to my mind, um, where it says, "Seeing that they are fulfilled," it's like a portion of this tower has already been constructed. And when we get into the similitudes part of the book, similitudes nine, we're actually talking future tense, whereas visions is talking past tense, where she's saying that it's already been fulfilled. And similitudes is talking present day and even future tense. Well, mm -hmm. haven't the foundation already mm -hmm. been laid? The, definitely the foundations have been laid. The first four foundations have been laid already. The first one being that rock that we know as the Messiah. And, you know, the second foundations were the patriarchs from Adam to uh, Seth I made up the, the next foundation and then starting with about Abraham um, going all the way through maybe through the prophets were another foundation and then you have the apostles right yeah they were another foundation but there was a break in the building of the tower we hear about uh, in similitudes uh, remember, um, and, I, and I do suggest you guys go ahead and read ahead, um, go ahead and get an audio book and listen to it or even read this book and get into similitudes, you'll see that there was a break in the building of the tower. Now, what that means to me is that after the apostles, after the, we entered what's known as the church age, there was no construction of the tower, but this construction period started sometime here recently. Maybe in 1886, maybe in 2014 or 2015, or somewhere in between. But now we know that the process, that the building has started again. Mm -hmm. 38. As for the tower which thou seest built, it is myself, namely the church, which have appeared to thee both now and herefore to. Wherefore, ask what thou wilt concerning the tower, and I will reveal it unto thee. And thou mayest rejoice with the saints. Okay, so now this is an important part of the story here. Again, this is Hermes, and he's seeing a vision. It's kind of like a dream. Um, it's a daydream because it's about noon when he's getting this. But he's actually communicating with this church figure. 
and she actually looks like a woman to him. So that's how we know that it is a dream or a vision because, you know, we're talking about the Big C Church, that church that was created before the earth was even created. Yeah, we're, we're not talking about the, um, the church that's down the street. No. We're talking about the, the church that was created, yes, like you said, before the, uh, the land was created. Notice this part where it says, For that tower which thou seest is myself the church. So the tower is the church. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we need to understand is, you know, when we're considering ourselves to be stones of the spiritual temple, what we're actually building is the church, the Big C Church. Right. Um, and it also, we can also look at that as the kingdom of heaven because after this church is created, it as a one solid unit will pass through the tribulation and emerge on the other side of the tribulation and go through the millennial age. And one thing I don't know if it's going to cover it in this section, but there's the tower and there's also a courtyard that will make up the, the entire compound. So when we're thinking about the book of Revelation, you have the 144,000, which will make up the tower. But you also have that multitude that no man can number that will make up the courtyard. Okay, I have a question, and uh, I hope that this isn't a silly question or a stupid question. No such thing. But how is it that the church was built before you know the land and the earth and all that but now it's being built again well you have to understand how we are spirit beings and how our spirits existed before the earth was created right we, even when adam was created and walking around even though he was the only human on the planet at the time our spirits had already been created and they were in existence mm -hmm. well the, our spirits back then even made up what would be the future stones of okay. this church is just that we had to go through the 6,000 years of human history so that we could evolve to the point where we could be spiritual beings and ready to go into this spirit church. Okay. So, I so I guess one way of thinking about it, and you know, you guys can correct me if you if you if you think I'm wrong or whatever. Um, this church figure is all of our spirits. We all are. This church, we just get, have to get our stones right, right, mm -hmm. so that we can be fitted into the actual building. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand that. Thirty-nine. I said unto her, Lady, because thou hast thought me once worthy to receive from thee the revelations of all these things, declare them unto me. So she's telling Hermes to ask what it is that you want to know. What is it, you know, and, he, and he's like, you know, tell me everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I don't know what I need to know. You know, this isn't making sense to me right now. So, you know, you're going to have to get me started as far as what questions I'm even supposed to think about asking. Right. 40. She answered me, whatsoever is fit to be revealed unto you shall be revealed. Only let thy heart be with the Lord and doubt not. Whatsoever thou shalt see. Now, this is important that we doubt not. Yeah. You know, it, it, this this is scriptural text. This is the Shepherd of Hermas. This used to be a part of our Bible. You know, this is probably one of the most important books that we will ever read in the entire New Testament, if not the entire Bible altogether. Um, because, again, it gives us instructions uh for entering the kingdom of heaven, whereas we didn't get that in any other scriptural document. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's important to not doubt when we hear this stuff, you know, and start questioning whether this is, you know, legitimate or whether it's just man made up stuff or not. Because if we don't put faith in what we hear, we're not actually going to put forth the effort to do this stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially when it starts getting into the commands. And, you know, start making, start talking about these life changes that we have to uh, do. You know, if we're doubting, then we won't take it serious enough, you know, and, you know, we may continue on in our selfishness or in our anger 
or you know whatever it is whatever it is that passion that's going to prevent us from entering the kingdom right mm -hmm. just because you know as the as it being an apocryphal book or a lost hidden book you know there's this this little bit of doubt that seems to want to make you say well you know maybe it's not true and all that kind of stuff but you're gonna have to bypass that in order to to get what what's there for you yeah and you have to understand when it comes to scripture man may be given the opportunity to write down things no different than Stacy and I are given the opportunity to make this video but when it comes to scripture it, it all of it comes from the father I've probably read maybe 600 scriptural documents from the lost books of the Bible, all of the 66 books in the Bible, all of the books in the Apocrypha, and, you know, the hidden books, the Dead Sea Scrolls, all kinds of documents. And every one of them, when you have the understanding of what's actually in the Bible, you recognize those other documents as scriptural texts. What I'm trying to say is man can't write scripture. If, if we were to try to sit down today and try to come up with some type of scripture or some type of writing and then try to pass it off as being scriptural, it's not going to work. It's not going to pass the mustard. It's not going to have the same um, infallibility as the rest of the documents like Enoch does or like Jubilees does. You know, it's not going to follow the same pattern and rhyme as the rest of the Bible. All of the scripture fits in like a puzzle. So any scriptural documents you read, you can almost rest assured that it is of the Father, whether it's considered canonical or not. Because you have to remember who it was that chose these 66 books that we call the Bible. It wasn't the Father. It was the Pope. He the one picked those books out. Yeah. Uh, uh, a guy named Constantine in the Council of Nicaea or the Council of Trent. You know, him and his Catholic buddies decided to get rid of a lot of the books that are necessary for our salvation. And, you know, of course, you know, we're not talking about going to heaven salvation. All of us are going to go to heaven eventually. We're talking about being saved through the tribulation, actually being able to inherit the earth. Mm -hmm. We have to have all of that information if we want to get there. 41. I asked her, Lady, why is the tower built upon the water? She replied, I said before to thee that thou wert very wise to inquire diligently concerning the building. Therefore, thou shalt find the truth. Okay, so we remember from the parable that this tower was actually built on, on the water. Mm -hmm. And so Hermes is like, hey, well, why is it sitting out there in the middle of the water? Right. 42. Hear therefore why the tower is built upon the water, because your life is and shall be saved by water. For it is founded by the word of the Almighty and Honorable Name, and is supported by the visible power and virtue of God. So what this is referring to is baptism. Yeah. Again, we want you guys to feel the need to go in and actually read this book for yourself. And... This is one of the only books that stresses baptism, even tells us the purpose of baptism and what it does for us, you know, in all of the scripture. Um, this is the first one that goes into detail. You see over in the King James Version of the Bible in the book of Mark, chapter 16 and 16, it says that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So this is telling us that it is actually necessary to be baptized if we're interested in the salvation. And this goes for both kinds of salvation. You know, if we are unbaptized and we die, we're not necessarily going to go to that place called heaven. What we're going to end up doing is being reincarnated and come back down here to earth to get it right again and in that new lifetime we should try to be baptized or we may not still um, have the opportunity to go on to what's known as those higher mansions. Mark is telling us that being baptized is necessary for our salvation.
And then you see right there in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, it says, The like figure ran to even baptism does also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, we have to realize that this is what the Messiah actually did for us. Before the Messiah, when we wanted to be purified or when we needed to be cleansed of our sins, we had to use the blood of goats or the blood of lambs uh, for the purification process. Well, what the Messiah did, what they mean by he, he died for our sins, was he actually changed that blood into water. And so now, instead of us sprinkling blood on our doorpost for a purification that, you know, will have to be redone every year during the Feast of Passover, now we can go through baptism and our sins can be all pured away, purified away. We learn in the Shepherd of Hermas that the first time that we are baptized, we are forgiven of all of the sins that we have committed previously. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of uh, churches no longer do baptism. Really? A lot of churches um, uh, discourage. I want to say uh, discourage people from getting as if it's not relevant anymore. Well, that reminds me of what Antiochus Epiphanes did back when he prevented the people from actually getting circumcised. Mm -hmm. You know, baptism is the new circumcision. And, you know, by telling somebody that they aren't to be baptized actually is taking away the new covenant. That's the that's what the new covenant is all about is our purification through baptism right 43 and i answering said unto her these things are very admirable but lady who are those six young men that build and remember that when she came to meet with hermas out in the field and um when he was about to get the vision she has six men with her. Yeah. Well, we're going to learn right here who those six men are. 44. They are, says she, the angels of God, which were first appointed, and to whom the Lord has delivered all his creatures, to frame and build them up, and to rule over them. For by these the building of the tower shall be finished. So these are the initial archangels. If you remember the book of Genesis, the father said he was it was like he was having a communication with some other people when he said, should we make man in our image? Yeah, and let you, us make man. Let us make man in our image. You're right. And you say, well, who was he talking to? These are the people, or these are the angels, these are the beings that he was talking to, these angels here. But notice that it's six of them instead of seven. Who's right. missing? That would be Satan. Yeah, the first angel ever created. Yeah. And so he's the one, instead of having seven of them, Satan is actually missing. We find out later on in the Shepherd of Hermes that he's out doing some devilish stuff even to this day. Yeah. I think it is in similitude five or six where he's being portrayed as being the shepherd of the disobedient and leading them into pleasurable things mm -hmm. yeah. and their destruction. Right. So when we're thinking about these angels here, um, we're going to hear from one angel, particularly in this book. He is Uriel. We learn that he is the angel that's in charge of our repentance. Another angel that we're going to hear from in this book is Michael, who is the lawgiver. We also heard about him in the book of Revelation and in the book of uh, Daniel chapter 12. Um, even in Malachi chapter 3 and chapter 4, and I can go on, he's in um, Exodus chapter 23, I think it is verse 23. He, he's this figure that stands for those who actually keep the covenant. He's known as the covenant angel. But then you have these other angels too, like Gabriel, you have Raphael, and even a few others that I can't name here to make up these six angels who are in charge of building up and protecting humanity. Right. It says the Father delivered them, delivered all his creatures over to these angels. Yeah, they, they have the charge over us, you know, 
even all the way back to the days of Adam, their responsibility is taking care of us. That's why when we saw in the previous class how the church figure made Hermes sit down first is because these angelic figures are here to watch over us instead of the other way around. Hermes was like, you're the lady, you sit down first. And she's like, no, I'm an angel. You're the human. You sit down first. 45. And who are the rest who bring them stones? Yep. And, you know, like I said, guys, go over and watch that other video. But it's talking to, remember, there was thousands of individuals. You had these six exalted angels who were in charge of the building. So you have the six archangels who the father has delivered all humans over to but then you have these lower level angels who are actually doing the work of moving these stones well i would just say that remember how satan took i believe a third of the angels with him but there were many 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 angels that were left to do the father's work yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so you have this hierarchy that's being talked about here mm -hmm. 46 they also are the holy angels of the Lord, but the other are more excellent than these. Wherefore, when the whole building of the tower shall be finished, they shall all feast together beside the tower and shall glorify God because the structure of the tower is finished. So it's going to be a huge party where you got these archangels, you got these lower level angels, and you even got humans that are right. all feasting together. Yeah, because... After we have completed um, and perfected ourselves um, to become part of the tower, now we we'll all rejoice. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's one of the changes that humanity will go through. You heard about the Great Awakening is that we're actually going to have a closer relationship to these angels, too. Hmm. You know, I don't know if we're going to be able to see, or see them, but we're definitely going to be able to feel their presence among us. And so, you know, yeah, we'll be rejoicing and partying together at that time. Yeah, they will be uh, helpers. Yeah. You know, they'll help us get through the tribulation. Yeah, and, you know, it's prophesied that we will actually even see them in action during the tribulation. There will be times when we're going to be in so much need of angelic help that we'll actually be able to see them doing stuff. Yeah, that's why we want to, we want our... Uh, stones to be polished and clean so that when we do call on these angels during this tribulation um, you know we won't hold ourselves back uh, yeah we'll be able to fully um, give ourselves to it I guess that's what I'm saying yeah by by having our stones clean gives us the opportunity to commune with these yeah. angels and because we we'll learn that Many of these angelic figures, especially these virgins that we're going to hear about, will not live or dwell in right. a place that's unclean. Yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot about that, but they won't stick around. I mean, yeah, they're going to Yeah, because go away. They're, they're, they're clean. I mean, they're in the presence of the Father at all times. Yeah. And, you know, we're not. And we're, 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 we're sinful. And, yeah. And we're not you know, perfected as they are, and they're just not, you know, they're just not going to deal with uncleanness. But, but you think humans are the same way. You know, if you have a people that is trying to attain to righteousness, right. and you put them around a bunch of people who are using profanity and mm -hmm. doing foul things, yeah. they're not going to stay there. Yeah. You know, they, they, they're going to feel too uncomfortable in that environment to stay there. Right. And they're going to separate themselves one way or the other. Yeah, you feel polluted. Um, right, mm -hmm. even being in that environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the same way with these angels. You know, we're going to find out that, you know, if, if we try to get them to come amongst us in this polluted environment... They're just going to leave. They're just going to go somewhere else. And the problem with that is that the wicked angels are going to move in. Yeah, Hermes tells us about this too. Yeah. Um, yeah. The wicked angels, even the Gospels, tell us about how if we don't keep our house clean. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, other wicked angels will, wicked spirits will come in and take over. I think you're t talking about when the Messiah says when... When one demon is cast out, he'll go get right. seven of his buddies and bring them in or something like yes. that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 47. I asked her, saying, I would know the condition of the stones and the meaning of them. 
what it is. Yeah, because you remember that there was various conditions. It started off talking about these stones that were square and white. Mm -hmm. But then it went on to talk about stones that had clefts in them. Some of the stones were rough. Many of the stones were white and round stones. And then you had stones that were kicked out into the highway and some was even burned up. So Hermes is like, what? What's up with all of these stones? Right. Mm -hmm. 48. She answering said unto me, Are thou better than the others that this should be revealed unto thee? For others are both before thee and better than thou art, to whom these visions should be made manifest. Yeah, John didn't get this vision. Paul didn't get this vision. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John didn't get this vision. They didn't get this understanding. Mm -hmm. But Hermas is actually the one getting this understanding. He's saying, are you better than John? Mm -hmm. Are you better than Luke? You know, how are you? How is it that you're going to get this vision when those guys were much better than you are, didn't even get this understanding of what you're about to get? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that speaks uh, to us now. A lot of times we think that um, the pastor and the bishop and the uh, priest or the rabbi should get the information but you know sometimes the father I I've received the word from the father from our children so yeah. you know it doesn't just because you're on a or you believe you're on a higher status does not necessarily mean that the father can't use the ones on a lower status well you have to remember the prophecy is that those who are on this so-called lower status are actually going to get the revelations of the end times when we get into the point where we're in that Daniel chapter 12 scenario, those people in the exalted positions are going to be the last one to get the revelations. And what it boils down is, is to their humility. Mm -hmm. Some of these people are just a little bit too arrogant to actually get an understanding of what's going on simply because they think they know it all already. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. 49. Nevertheless, that the name of God may be glorified, it has been and shall be revealed unto thee for the sake of those who are doubtful and think in their hearts whether these things are so or not. Yeah, so he's given this information to Hermes for our benefit. Mm -hmm. You know, that's important for us to understand. Like we said, this is probably one of the most important books that we'll ever read is this Shepherd of Hermes. And, you know, it's being reserved for us for this end times. You know, a lot of people will try, like you said earlier, when when it's considered apocryphal uh, writings, people will question their legitimacy. Well, many of those apocryphal writings were reserved for us in the end times. Like when you look over in the book of Enoch, it said that it's written for us in the end times. Well, this Shepherd of Hermas, I believe, is also written for us in end times, like our Father knew with his infinite wisdom that it was going to be suppressed and hidden. And then it was going to be now that we are actually going to be able to read and understand what's going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. 50. Tell them that all these things are true. And there is nothing in them that is not true, but all are firm and truly established. You guys will listen to this. This right here. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very sophisticated book in the level of parable, you know, that, that we're going to hear about throughout this book. But, you know, I've lived this stuff. You know, I don't like talking about myself too much. But, you know, I, I was trained in engineering and how to do experiments and I've, I've, I've done this. I've actually tried everything in this book. And I can tell you for a fact that it is all absolutely true down to the letter. Every word, every jot, every tittle of the Shepherd of Hermes is firm and truly established. Okay, so that was the last one that we're going to cover in this chapter. Yeah, because it's going to change gears here. We'll see in the next one, verse 51 says, Here now then concerning the stones that are in the building... And so she's going to go off and start explaining those stones in greater detail. Yeah, I would encourage you guys to to go ahead and read it. And so when we do, um, when you do listen to the class, you can um, have a better explanation of it. 
Yeah, because, you know, Stacy and I have a lot of experience with this book. Not only reading the book, but having to live this stuff out. You know, we have seen ourselves as these flawed stones over time. And we've actually had to take the time to have our stones corrected over, you know, several years. So, you know, you want to know what's going on, what it's talking about, because when we actually get into that class, that next class on it, we're going to try to tell you some stuff that you may not catch by reading it but you know you will have you will have wanted to have read it already or even listened to the audiobook already yeah and you might be able to you know start identifying yourselves and you know have a heads up as to some of the things that you'll listen out to when we do the next class yep that's true but you know like you see in here on my screen we are suffering from a little bit of battery power here on the hillbilly homestead so we're going to have to save the explanation of the stones for the next class if you got anything out of this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the dislike button, but leave us a comment. Either way, let's continue the discussion below. Godspeed and Shalom. Shalom.